Oh, I'll often you guys do this. Have a little. Oh, do you think you do this? Oh, uh, yeah, just depend. Where, yeah. you know, what we got going on. Yeah, but yeah. We like to try to make use of the theater when we can. Yeah, yeah. All righty, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the Wild Center on this rainy, lovely winter day that we're having. Uh, my name's Leanne, I'm our Interpretive Programs Manager, and I am so excited to kick off this new year, our Science Speaker Series with Dave Hall. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about this wonderful human being who has centered their entire life around the pursuits of being outside, observing nature, and getting kids connected with the outdoors. He is the founder of Primitive Pursuits, which is a youth-focused nature awareness program, teaching them skills in nature observation and simply the joy of just being outside. Beyond that, he has been a naturalist, doing presentations, guiding people everywhere from the Adirondack Mountain Club through Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, so very New England focus here, which is perfect for our setting, as well as an author. His newest book, A Naturalist Companion Guide, which is all about how you can get out in nature and observe wildlife respectfully and how we can learn from our wildlife neighbors. This book is in fact available in the store. After this, we'll be having a book signing to follow. So if you're interested, please do wait until after the presentation and meet us out in the wild supply so that we can get you set up with a book and an opportunity to chat one-on-one -on -one with Dave. So without further ado, you all came here to see Dave speak about more than just dams and lodges and beaver engineering and construction, but more about how they relate together, how beavers work as a family unit and what maybe we could learn or glean from that, along with adorable baby beaver photos promised. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn you over to our star of the show. Dave, feel free to take it away. All right. Thanks guys. <laughs> Leanne's been great. I reached out one day and she's a gal. No, thank you for, for having me. Um, so I have an interesting relationship with beavers. Um, I think we all have seen beavers and seen their impacts on our world, but I have beavers and in a sense they have me. I'm their human, they're my beavers. Um, and I'll talk about that. So this goes a little bit beyond all the important things that they do. Um, this is Apple and we're gonna be talking about three very personal beavers to me. Uh, that's a Mick, or no, that's Merle, rather. You wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> but uh, back to Apple, that's Merle. And then this is a Mick in Apple, and I don't have any great pictures of a Mick because he doesn't like me. And that's his prerogative. He does not need to like me. There's Apple looking a little punk rock when she was younger. She went through a face, what can you say? <laughs> Two books that I'd like to recommend. This one's actually in the bookstore here, um, The Beaver. It's got a fancier new cover, but essentially it's the same book. This comes out of uh, Cornell, and that's Merle in the background, and I sent a photo of the book picture and Merle to the authors. Um, but it's a great, very scientific look at beavers. Um, they did a lot of research, and it's just fantastic. Um, this one everyone should read uh, right now. Leave the talk and just go get this book. But Ben Goldfarb did a great job really looking at the history of beavers, what this continent looked like before Europeans, the impact of losing this keystone species, and then kind of where we're at now. Um, and what we're learning is that wherever beavers go, life is better for everybody. Maybe not us sometimes, because they, they don't care about our, our apple trees and such. And then this is my book. Um, this is basically a collection of skills that you can't dig up from, say, an archaeological site. You know, we're all here because our ancestors had a great knowledge of how to interpret what they saw, how to get close to animals, hunt, trap them if they need. We can use those same skills to do what we want, right? If we want to just become a better naturalist, somebody who's more in tune with their environment, these are those skills. And um, my mom said it's really wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, there's that. Um, 
and you may not think the next review is maybe is legit, but Nature Conservancy said it's one of the best books they've read on the topic. So if you're looking for something that <laughs> I'm still with mom personally, I kind of have to be. So before we get going though on beavers, I do want to give you a, just a, a few things to do. Maybe you love going outside. Maybe you love watching animals, but it all starts with some real foundational skills. And if you don't do them, you will never have these close encounters with animals where they're acting as unafraid creatures, right? And so you have to use your senses fully. That means get out of yourself and be open and fully look. You have to use your ears and your sense of smell. And you know, I hope, hopefully everybody sees that mink looking at us, right? But you also have to be quiet, right? You have to be quiet. You can't smell like uh, you know aftershave. You can't give them any information because if you do, you suddenly you know you're you're down, and they they you've you've been identified and they know where you are. But I want you to take a moment and think about this concept called baseline. So baseline is anything that's life supporting and kind of regular in our lives. Let's think about brushing our teeth, eating our dinner, going to bed, grooming, saying hello, and socializing. But you know, I was at the grocery store once. And all of a sudden, there was a big um, announcement, and they said, please, everybody stay in place. Somebody had had a medical emergency, and the paramedics were coming in, right? Suddenly, a break in baseline. And so for wildlife, that means anything from a mild concern, like, hmm, I better keep an eye on that house cat or that bobcat, to, oh my gosh, I have to fight for my life in order to live, right? It's a break in the normalcy. Not that that isn't normal, but it's a break in those life-supporting um, behaviors, right? And so when you're out there, you have to say, am I the cause of a break in baseline for that animal? Am I pushing through the woods in such a way that I'm causing things to be alarmed, right? And so you might have to do a little you know, self-reflection. I'm not going to read all that. I hope you did. <laughs> it says, don't thoughtlessly break baseline. Sometimes when you get good at this stuff, you do break baseline. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, my friend Don and I used to go out into this field by the University of Buffalo, real wilderness. Nothing, you know, you, you guys have nothing on the University of Buffalo. Um, but anyway, we would sit in this hay field and we would call foxes to us by mimicking the cries of a rabbit that was in distress. And we would get them to come in quite a little bit. You know, so that would be a break in baseline purposely done to get a response that you are hoping for. All right, oh, and this is just to show I'm legit. You know, if you do this, right, you're gonna see stuff. That's a kitty cat. That is not. So this one I like because it was taken in an urban area um, right across from a city park in Ithaca. And we have a lot of great urban wildlife. So when we do this stuff, sure, I love coming to the Adirondacks. Any excuse, I usually get up here as much as I can each year. And uh, now that I know Rich, I'm going to stay with him every time. But um, it doesn't matter where I am. You know, I've been in Manhattan and seen some pretty crazy things. It's the only time I've seen a red-tailed hawk turn on the crows. It's like this, this uh, red tail with a little attitude, you know? All right, Old Forge. They're all around. Another urban fox. My backyard. Yeah. Urban mink, right? Very pale. These are some otters that I've been watching. Um, this was last year. I've only seen one this year, but apparently they're both back. Um, you know, they look cute, but look at those teeth. That bass did not have a chance. Oh, look at that. And that one, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get another close-up this year where you can see the scar on the nose. So if you do these things right, you're going to be seeing things acting baseline, or maybe not, but hopefully you're not the cause of the break in baseline, right? I want you to think about wandering, breaking the routines of normalcy. Like a lot of us get into ruts. And by wandering, I mean just follow your bliss a little bit, follow whatever seems to be intriguing or following your interest, but don't you know, get lost. <laughs> don't walk off the edge of a cliff. You want to be home at the end of the day or where you want to be at the end of the day. And I chose this picture because this actually was just off Little Tupper Lake. Um, we were camping on this island and we ran into a volunteer ranger and I said, oh, any bears or moose around? He's like, oh, we had one moose earlier, but no, nothing. But at the end of the day, around dusk, my younger son and I got in the canoe and I said, we're just gonna be quiet. We're gonna make no noise and go slow. And we heard some beavers and we 
you know, saw a muskrat, and then we're going up, and I hear something in the thicket, and I'm really expecting a deer, and within 20 minutes, we had three bears, and they were stripping uh, mountain holly berries off the bushes, and this bear had just spotted us, come through the thicket, and he's on a, on a lodge looking at us, like, what are you guys doing? We got a good thing going here, go, on, go away. You know, you never know what you're going to find when you wander. Uh, this was actually a mile away or less from the Ithaca airport, uh, a den of coyotes. And yeah, just the cutest things. I sort of wish I'd just scratched one on the nose, but I didn't. This was just last week in Florida, right? So while you're being quiet and stealthy, trying to move in a way that doesn't draw attention to you, everything else is right? They're doing that. They're trying to remain subdued, right? Even the predators and the prey just want to not draw attention to them. So these people are birding, doing a little urban birding. This is Fall Creek in Ithaca. Can you see what's watching them? It might be hard to see in this lighting, but there it is. You see it now? There's a mink watching them, and I was really psyched to see that they saw it. I was across the creek, and I had watched the mink go across the ice, and um, I was really happy that these two people who were taking time to bird and be purposeful actually saw it. So that was pretty cool. So I'm going to tell you a little story just to drive home the, the idea of baseline. So this is a preserve that's in Tompkins County. That's my friend Morgan when she was a student. Now she's an adult and we're still friends. And this is the park preserve. And there's a beautiful boardwalk across the park preserve. And one day, I was by myself. And I walk across the park, the, the boardwalk, and I kept going down this little herd trail. And then I got into real quiet mode because I was hoping for an experience. You know, I didn't know if I'd get it, but I was hoping for an experience. And I got on my hands and knees, and for about the last 20 yards or so, I crawled real quietly. And I got to the edge of this little ledge where beavers had kind of tucked a lodge against the bank. And sure enough, there was a young beaver there just fiddling with a stick down below. And I'm pretty sure it was, you know, at the time I was like, I'm pretty sure it's an adolescent. And then here comes mama, or the adult, the other adult. And they make these very, you know, beautiful sounds. I don't know if anybody's had guinea pigs or been really close to beavers, but they make really sweet sounds. And I'll talk about that sound in a little bit. But while I'm on my belly, behind me, I keep hearing just little subtle rustles, little subtle, um, maybe, you know, a twig moving here and there, but nothing, like I'm like, it's a squirrel or it's a, it's a bird. But I can't push back because I'll scare these animals off, so I have to wait. And so for about five minutes, I watch these two animals have this really sweet, just kind of uh, parental adolescent experience, and then, um, but I keep hearing these sounds. Finally, the, the beavers swim away and I, I can push back and I look behind me, and it's not a chipmunk, it's four human beings. <laughs> and they're coming in with such purpose right, because they were after the same experience I was. So I quietly got up and I kind of signaled that there's things happening, but I had to wait I, on the boardwalk. To, like, how did you learn to move with such, you know, in such a purposeful way? And the kids had uh, done my program, not with me, but they've been participants in Primitive Pursuits. So that was, that was very um, gratifying. So the next week I'm back at the park preserve and I'm sitting on the bench right about where I'd taken that picture with Morgan. and up the ways of the parking area, and in my mind, I can hear the music after the guy slams his door. I can hear the music of him, you know, listening over his, ear, his ear, earbuds and all that. And he comes on a power walk down the trail, and there's four beavers out. And I'd been watching them for like 15 minutes, and it was great because they're all just doing beaver things, right? Well, as he hits the boardwalk, you know, one slaps its tail, the next one submerges, and the other two just disappear. He comes power walking past me into the state force. He has no idea what he has caused, right? So don't be that guy, okay? Enough lecturing. I'm going to sit down now. All right, but this is, this is one of the beavers from the park preserve. So an ethogram, right, that's basically just a list of potential behaviors. And I always say don't force an answer. If you don't know why, don't force it. But, you know, another way to just, um, you know, kind of couch all that is just ask yourself what's going on and why, right? And if you don't know, you very well may not. Be open. Make a short list, but don't be, you know, attached to anything until maybe you get more experienced, right? There's still things they don't know. Uh, you know, it's, animals are complicated. Birds are complicated. 
So we're going to not spend too much time here. I used to make the audience guess, but I added a lot more to the other end of this little lecture. This little guy out my uh, bathroom window is tapping a tree, right? Took me a while to figure that out. This loon's literally laying low, um, doesn't want to draw attention to its nest, scavenging bald eagles. Uh, this was, uh, I, see, I can't make that joke when I'm in Tompkins County. I can see, yeah, this is over at Stewart Park at the end of Cougar Lake, and people, I can see if people are listening. If I say, oh, this is over on whatever pond, you'd be like, yeah, I've never seen one. I'm not sure if they actually exist in the Adirondack. Seen lots of moose. This one was from uh, Algonquin Park. This is a uh, pileated going after um, ash borer. You, you know, that's an ash tree. That's pooping. Yeah, <laughs> grooming, right? Not a, and these are tundra swans mooning another tundra swan. No, they're feeding, right? So when you get into this stuff, right, you've got that base, those base skills of being stealthy, using your senses, being quiet, you can get into all kinds of stuff, right? You start to learn about what it is an animal's doing. You're not just seeing the animal, but you're starting to see the interaction, that unfolding drama that's always happening in wild places. So this is an idea, once you get good at this stuff, you can say, I understand what influences that species, right? And so here, I wanted Merle to go to a certain spot, so I drew him to, whoa, I drew him to that spot by leaving something he liked, right? We all are familiar with bird feeding. We're all familiar with fishing. It's all the same thing. You're getting that thing to do what you want, right, by offering it something somewhat fictitious or contrived. And this is quaking aspen that I've left for Merle. And you know what he did? He ate it. Um, you get into things like tracking. That is not a coyote. That's an Algonquin timber wolf. If you ever need to have a time in the woods, go up there for a few days, and you'll have a great time <laughs> tracking, right? Clearly not left by a field mouse. Um, that was from Merle, just coming back and forth into my pond. A track, right? This, in this case, I know what did that. That was Merle um, or Apple probably coming up through the ice and then leaving plates um, around the hole. Ethology. So that's the study. I don't know. What, what, all right, I'm going to just read this. The study of animal behavior with emphasis on the behavioral patterns that occur in natural environments. Whew. Man, what does that mean? So some of our more famous um, ethologists, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, a couple of my less famous nodes, but people who I've read a lot of their work, um, Joe Huto and Dr. Lynn Rogers. And if you look at them, they're all doing something somewhat similar. Um, they're right with the thing they're studying. They've bridged that gap somehow. And I will tell you, I've done the same thing. And it was, not, it was somewhat because of their influence, but it was from another person. And Dorothy Richards, has anybody ever read Beaver Sprite? Great, yeah, I'm speaking there on Saturday, if anybody's gonna be down near Dolgeville. Um, same lecture, essentially. Um, but anyway, Dorothy has an incredible story, and she was a huge influence on me. So she and her husband, Al, had property. They bought property outside of Little Falls near Dolgeville. And her husband had been one of the first graduates from ESF, and somehow they had found out that the, the DEC, or whatever they were called, was trying, they were trying to put beavers back into our environment. And they arranged to have a pair of beavers put on their land. Ignore that, whatever I just did. So they had beavers. It'll go away. Oh no, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do? That's really funny. Not used to the old school mouse. There you go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So anyway, they got beavers on their land. And just from a distance and over time, they were seeing the great influence that the beavers were putting onto the environment, you know, changing the landscape by putting up a dam, broadening that pond and making the water deeper, making the water table come up. And they were really enjoying it. They owned a little stationery store in town. Back then, people used to write things. And, um, yeah, I know. The other joke is that, um, unfortunately, the business never went anywhere. It's really a shame. It's a stationary store. See? Yeah, sorry. That's how you set it up. But anyway, they were in town, and these huge rains came in. And back then, they didn't have paved roads, and the roads got awful, and they decided to stay overnight in their business. And Dorothy got what I would call an intuition, that something was wrong at the beaver pond. 
So as soon as they could, they got back the next day and they went out, you know, using flashlights or whatever, and they were looking out into the beaver pond, which was really flowing. And every so often they would see something floating up in the current and it was a beaver's nose. Right? Somebody illegally had tried to trap a beaver. So Al, I want you to imagine a tall, lanky, Norman Rockwell type character just went into the, this flow and went in and grabbed a huge beaver with no care to his own safety. Somebody had indeed cable trapped it. It was attached to like a rock or a cinder block or whatever. And this wasn't legal to trap beavers at this time in New York State. Well, they get the animal to shore. The beaver is collapsed, unconscious in Al's arms. They take it back to their home, because why not? And um, they didn't know what to do. You know, Al had gone to ESF for forestry, but he certainly wasn't a veterinarian. Dorothy had no skills in this department. So they decided, we'll put it up in the guest room on the rug. And they went downstairs and had their evening tea. 20 minutes later, they hear sounds. Walking, something's walking upstairs, probably a beaver. And then they hear thunk. Dorothy goes up to investigate. The beaver was up walking around in the guest room. It had chewed the leg off of a bureau. I mean, it's a dead thing, not the beaver, the bureau. I don't know why it would have done that, but that's how the story goes. Dorothy closes the door and is inside the bedroom now and gets on the bed. The beaver keeps coming over to the bed and standing up and trying to check her out. Dorothy, whether wisely or foolishly, makes stairs for it. There's a cedar chest. She puts some books there. She gets back on the bed. Within a few minutes, the beaver goes doo-doop, doo-doop, and she now has a 45-pound beaver sitting on her. This is her introduction to Delilah and basically her gateway into generations of beavers. Some could suggest that things got a little out of hand. I don't. She, despite, much like Jane Goodall, who had no formal training, Dorothy became the world's most knowledgeable person when it came to um, beavers. I would say she still may hold that position um, because lots of things have been learned about beavers. There are some great studies going on and lots of capable people, but Dorothy at some point got a permit to have beavers live in her home, which maybe, these, it was a different time. It was a different time, you know? I believe that's hunk eating lettuce off of a plate but what she got to see was these personalities evolve. And she saw that some of them had a sense of humor and liked to pull a prank. And some of them were a little more conservative. And some of them were serious. And some of them were kind and gentle. And, but none of them were mean. You know, they're very gentle species. So this is my house. Let's sit in the background. And um, my wetland, and there's one of the lodges where my much more modest-sized beaver pond exists. And when I started getting into this, I had to ask myself, am I going to compromise the beavers that essentially are going to get habituated to me? And my conclusion was probably not. I can't say that with 100% certainty because they could move on and maybe be less fearful of people. But right now, as I see it, the biggest threats, and I'm not against trapping, don't get me wrong, I'm a deer hunter and I, I really appreciate what the DEC does. Um, but right now, there's unlimited trapping of beavers. Um, the, there's big threats to them are when they disperse, when young ones disperse. Sometimes they're going overland. They, they get hit by cars. And if somebody was to trap, they could literally go up in the state forest, lure all my beavers out, and trap them if they were so inclined, because there's no limits anymore. So I did a lot of soul searching, and I don't think what I'm doing is putting them in any threat. So, I have bridged the gap myself with beavers. So this is a mick and apple. And so how do I go from having two young yearling beavers show up to them eventually trusting me? And like I said, a, a mick still doesn't trust me after almost two years. He's still, I don't know why not, but whatever. We'll talk about that later. My feelings being hurt by a beaver. <laughs> you know, initially they'll slap at you and they don't like you. And then eventually, how do I get to this point where this is Merle, baseline grooming with his back turned to me three feet away, just hanging out, totally unfearful. Well, it's a process, and I'm going to tell you what I did. And this is Apple, just being beautiful as ever. So when Merle showed up, and it was the same process basically for Apple, 
instead of being invisible, I had to just gently let them know I was there. I still had to pay attention because if I was too much in their face or too aggressive, they would leave. You know, they're wild animals, they don't have to stick around. And so with Merle, I would sit, not by the pond's edge, but a little ways back. But I would say, hey man, how's it going? Just let them get used to my voice. But I introduced apples, right? Jane, Jane Goodall introduced food to her primates, right? And so slowly, I would, I would initially throw apple slices in the middle of the pond and he'd get used to my voice. But slowly, I would throw the apples out less distance each time. And before you know it, he was grabbing pieces of apples 10 feet out and then just in the shallows, and he'd come up into the shallows, and I'd talk to him. But I was happy to see that Merle slipped into the water, okay? And these are all pretty much in sequence, these next uh, half dozen photos or so. But in real time, you kind of saw the process um, of decision making in a beaver's life. So here's Merle, he's like, okay. Wolf hybrid thing came by, there's tracks of the coyote. These are all real, and I'll, I'll project onto these, you know, anthropomorphize a little bit. But he decided, I gotta groom. I gotta think about this situation a little. I've gotta stand uh, like a little soldier, I guess. Um, he was grooming more. It's very important to Merle. He, he was solo. He had to look good at all times. Um, he had to fuel up. And then he started working on the lodge a few hours later. And by the end of the day, he had a viable, sanctuary. It was not finished, but it would hold back any kind of threat, right? And so I saw, it was really cool to see that in Merle's life. Like, and you know, and I do have to wonder, was he really planning to stay? Was he thinking about it? Because not all of his needs were being met by him discovering this kind of old, pathetic farm pond. He wanted a mate, really, as well, right? He had a lot of his boxes checked off, but to find a female, no, nope, he wasn't going to get that that year. So, here's a picture, uh, just the next watershed over from mine, where a creek goes through. This is a mystery. I'm going to see if anybody knows. So this is a dam, and we've got all these little pyramid humps. There's probably six or seven or more of them there. What do we have? Does anybody want to guess what that is? I'm going to tell you it's beaver-related, and we never had these at my house, although they're very common. Anyone? Nobody. All right. Well, there's a reason we didn't get these things at our house. There weren't other beavers around, right? There weren't beavers upstream, and there weren't beavers downstream for a very long ways. But what these are are scent mounds. And that dam, I'm pretty sure, marks two, the, the divide between two colonies. And beavers can be very territorial as they need to. They, they need the space to do, they need space to do what they're going to do. But to put that many, I have never seen that in my lifetime. And so what they do is they make these mounds and then they have this musky secretion um, caster, right, that gets expressed and it tells other beavers what's going on. Like, don't come here. Um, it might tell about sexual availability, it might tell age, but mostly it's a territorial thing, you know, so that's pretty neat. So, cycles of vulnerability. It's a point in, an, in a species life when they're extra vulnerable. So an animal, right, a wild animal can be vulnerable at most any time due to injury, disease, weather. But think of a beaver or a bird or whatever, but in this case we'll talk beavers because that's what we're doing. Sometimes animals have to get away from the safety of the water, right? A fish may be drawn from the depths of Cayuga to spawn up some little tributary, you know, in Tompkins County, and then I can pick it up with my hands. Right? But this is a young beaver that has been pushed out of its territory because it is now a year or two old. Right, And I actually saw it coming from a hillside. It crossed 96B, which is a pretty substantial road near my house, heading back to the wetland. We're going to talk about where it found its own place is what this is. This is a desperate beaver that even in winter was still looking for a place to have as its own. And this is, it's, and to be this late in the season without a lodge, without a larder, meaning, you know, a store of food to get you through the winter without anything. And the tail bites are my, this is my guess, those aren't fresh from the car incident. That's probably from another beaver just really um, attacking it with some ferociousness. So it's not always easy to be a beaver. And, and just because they're cute and furry doesn't mean they're, they're potentially without, um, you know, concern. Um, 
all animals are. And if you're a, another beaver going through somebody's territory, you better look out. So when Merle, it makes me think of Merle, when he showed up, right, he didn't have the conflict of another colony trying to um, push him out, but he also didn't have the fortune of coming across a female that he could you know, set up shop with. Average weight, 40 to 70 pounds. Um, in their first year, they roughly gain, um, go up to 20 pounds. They start somewhere around one pound. They're cuter than anything. 70 pounds isn't odd. 90 pounds isn't odd. The largest beaver ever trapped was somewhere around 120 pounds. That's incredible. I bet there's some people in here that don't weigh close to that, right? Um, I put some asterisks, that's where I don't necessarily agree or there might be other information. In the wild, they say they can live 10 to 12 years. Um, Dorothy Richards, wild beavers, although she would supplement their you know, food regularly with willow and such, um, I think Delilah lived to be close to 20, right? Generally, two-year-olds, is this is the literature, leave home. I've questioned that as well. Merle was a two-year-old, but a Mick and Apple were one-year-olds. I've read multiple um, books where one-year-olds are the ones who get booted out. They, they get quietly escorted. Dad leaves home, you know. Listen to this closely, ch children. Dad will take you away. We're going camping. And then you don't, you know, I'm just kidding. But this is what I'm just, like, you look totally terrified. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but with beavers, um, <laughs> this poor kid came with her grandparents, all right? <laughs> and I'm just telling horror stories. No, but, but with uh, Dor Dorothy Richards' uh, beavers, <laughs> I really feel horrible. Uh, you'll be 15. Um, the male took the little ones away for like three days, and then he came back, and he, and he shushed them away gently. But um, beavers don't always stay in the same place. What they do is they build a dam, they set up a lodge. If they need to, they create a larder, um, stash sticks underwater. But they're eating, and they're, they're basically farming the edges of their wetland. And at some point, if they have to go too far and it becomes too difficult, they'll move downstream. They'll move upstream. They may move away all, entirely if it's not suitable you know, nearby. And so the park preserve beavers basically are farming this little watershed. You know, for four or five years, they'll be here. Then they move downstream for this, you know, and then while they're gone, this area recovers, and it's all great, right? Um, sexually mature, two to three years of age. I disagree, it can be younger. Um, give birth in the spring after three month gestation, which is right now, literally. Beavers are breeding right now, today, which is really neat. Um, average litters are two to five or four or whatever. All right, so I want you to know this. This is why we should all love beavers. Not to say they're not problematic sometimes. They bring up the water table, especially important in arid areas, but it doesn't mean it's not important out here. They build habitat and they create diversity, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Um, I'm going to forget that Adirondack example. Benefits to pasture. You know, this is a big thing out west where pastures can really have a horrible effect on these riparian environments if correctly managed. Beavers are brought in, they've raised the water table, the pasture becomes much more, vi you know, just flourishing up. He has a company called Beaver Solutions, and he has figured out a way to outsmart beavers so that we decide how far, how high, how, how high up the, um, the water comes, not the beavers. And it's basically just simple engineering and pipes and all that. So pretty cool things. And what they found is that actually cheaper on municipalities to just take some time and put in these you know, beaver deceivers, as they're generically called, than to just bring in a backhoe or a trapper every time. Because the beavers will return um, eventually. So detective work. Oh, man. I'm so long-winded. Um, I didn't know what this was when I first saw it. He, would, he was all itchy. I'm like, why is this beaver so itchy? Well, Merle was a groomer, right? <laughs> there were things that I had to learn along the way. I learned that beavers have a special claw. Their second inside back claw is split, kind of, almost like a comb. That's a roadkill beaver, unfortunately. I prefer it when I can actually say, hey, can you put your foot here and let me take a picture? Um, I do have some challengers or questions, some commonly held belief. Slapping, um, controlled tree felling, I can talk about a few of these. 
There's some people who say beavers slap to alert their fellow beavers. I think their fellow beavers pay attention, but really it's all about the perceived that. If, they, if I'm around strange beavers and I'm too close and they see me, they're saying, get out of here. They're trying to get me to move to verify that I am actually a thing. There's another belief that beavers fell trees towards the pond. And that makes sense, right? You don't want your tree to fall into the woods. But beavers are smart and they're very capable. But with all things being equal, if I'm a tree, I'm going to put more weight growing towards the light, the open area. And so if all things are equal when that beaver is chewing the tree down, the weight of the tree is just going to fall towards the water, my opinion. There's other things. But you start to form your own opinions based on, well, in my case, hundreds, thousands of hours of just hanging around the beaver pond, you know. So when Amick and uh, Apple were just through their first winter, I was left with a lot of questions. I was fairly convinced they were siblings. So I wasn't expecting that they would be parents or if they would be at all. Um, I didn't know if they would stay. I didn't know really if they were male or female, right? Didn't know a lot about them. I didn't know why they arrived late. My, my second pair of beavers arrived late April, which was quite a bit later than the average beaver was, would be when they're migrating. Lots of questions. So they gave me a mystery before the winter, their first winter came. So in the front left, that's where Merle's Lodge was, and that was where Amick and Apple decided to build their lodge. And I would sit basically out of frame to the right. That's where my bench is. And it became late September, and I'm like, where is their larder? They should be putting up food, you know, definitely into October. I'm like, I was really worried. Well, I walked up the pond. They just decided to put in a whole other lodge. Why would two beavers need another lodge didn't make any sense right we all know like you know they have limited energy we got to be careful with calories and all that didn't make any sense to me winter came that lodge was near flow they could get out of the pond easier i believe they did it for that reason i'm not sure but that's my theory but hey i guess they had nothing to do and they were feeling great so the winter came and went i saw apple as much as i could when the ice wasn't around and Right now, I can't see my beavers, probably when I get home, but you know, we've had enough ice where they can't break up through it and I can't see them and have my visits. And finally, the spring came around and I gave a talk one evening on beavers. And I came home and Apple was acting very strange. She wouldn't come over to have her nightly visit and for me to give her her nightly treat. And she was just swimming back and forth. And she seemed agitated. She seemed really like odd. She was not like that. She was normally like very chill and she'd come in and she'd wave and we'd chat. I'd tell her about my problems, you know, all that stuff. And the second night of her acting this way, I went over to the lodge and I hear, <laughs> and I hear little ones and I am just beside myself because I wasn't necessarily expecting it. So I bring my wife down and we're like, okay, one, two, and we think we're counting three. Well, there were little ones, right? Well, there's Chunk at about a month old. And it took about a month or more for them to start coming out. And Chunk was, let's just say, um, very confident. <laughs> and I'm sitting by the lodge one night, and I know. <laughs> I'm sitting by the lodge one night in the dark, and Apple comes with them to me. She brings all of them, and there's not one or two or three, there's four. And she brings them to me, and I'm sitting in the dark with my headlamp, and they're just, they're not eating solid food yet. They're not doing anything but nursing, really. They're fiddling with things. But they're like, well, I guess this guy's cool. She brought them to me to say, this guy's all right, you know? And that was very touching to have that kind of trust from an animal that has no good reason other than, you know, I'd invested time with her. So this is one of them. Um, so if there's any Star Wars fans in the, in the crowd, I am convinced that Ewoks exist. Uh, but they are the cutest things you'll ever see. Um, that's Apple with one of her little ones eating some willow. She would start, continue to bring them to me, and then she would kind of look over her shoulder and leave them with me. 
because she's nursing 100% at this time. And I don't know if there's any parents who have ever felt harried or a little stressed out, but she needed a little alone time. I, that's how I'm reading into it. She would kind of look over her shoulder and quietly leave as the little ones hung out with me. It's really sweet. And so there's mama, and there's a couple of little kids. And they are um, incredibly, I, it's funny, if you look at them, they're very difficult to tell apart. I could initially tell Chunk apart simply from his attitude. He would beeline to the dam and say, all right, I, I'm hungry. Get, let me have a piece of apple, please. And he'd sit on the dam, and the other ones weren't that confident. It took them a few weeks to get that confidence. But during that time, I could say, oh, here comes Chunk. But now I can't tell them apart anymore. They, they just all look way too similar. They can be a little nosy. Um, this is inches from the lens of my camera. Um, they can be very curious. They can be very cooperative. This is the first time I weighed them. I got the idea of weighing them. Um, I wanted to, you know, I journal. Whenever something interesting comes up, something noteworthy, I journal about it. And I'm like, well, I'm curious. How much does, I think this was a two-month-old beaver way. And I'm like, oh, it's going to take forever for me to get their confidence to walk up onto this scale that I got at the, you know, the reuse store. Ten minutes. <laughs> Just hanging out. I believe there were ten pounds at, at about eight weeks. Or, yeah, something like that. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> I have to look at my notes. And I've been doing that periodically. It's so interesting to see, though, these um, somewhat, what do I want to say, uh, less than polite animals, the little ones, grabbing things from parents, not knowing boundaries, learn to become very polite young adults. You know, they're like, oh, yeah, all it takes is a little sound, and they know, oh, yeah, I'm not bothering mom now. Oh, no, nope, my sibling has a piece of apple, and I'm going to wait my turn. And, and they learn that through their adults. Um, I've seen not Apple and uh, a Mick, I've literally seen um, adults shove an, a little one under water because it wanted the adult's food. And then moments later, see that little one say, oh, no, no, I got it. <laughs> you know, I don't like being shoved underwater. And they learn, right? This is all little ones, you know, just hanging out. Um, so it's not the end, right? I mean, it's the end of my lecture, but it's an ongoing story. Because um, I don't know what's going to happen in the spring. I'm, I'm very curious if the colony will stay. Will all of the little ones be escorted away? Will one be allowed to stick around? Because maybe there's new kits on the way. There likely are. I mean, literally right now, today could be a day that they're breeding. Um, we're about three months from now would be you know, about the right time to have uh, little ones be born, um, according to the last year's uh, schedule. So it, it's always a very interesting thing. So that's it. So what I'd like to do is just say, hey, you got any questions? None, because I don't, I don't know everything.